All right, take your Bible, go to Psalm chapter 85, if you have your Bible with you. Psalm chapter 85, and did a study recently on this chapter and wanted to share what I found with you. And I love the subject of revival, and I love revival singing, I love revival preaching, I love revival books, I like reading of the great revivals of the past. And, uh, you know, I just believe God loves to send revival, and I believe that God can do it. I believe that God's able when, when, uh, when we seek Him and, uh, and call upon His name, I just believe that God can send revival to our, to our direction. And I love 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 13, which says, if God said, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, He said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, He said, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. He said, now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. And recently I read the book called uh, The Soul of St. Louis, about the, the, the revivals of uh, St. Louis that took place years ago. And, and, and revival after revival took place in that great city. And, and uh, you know, when I read stories like that, and when I, when I read of revivals that took place in times past, there's something inside of me that just ignites that wants God to do it all over again that wants God to, to, to revive me personally, that wants God to revive us as a church, and God wants, to, wants God to just revive our nation. You know, we look, you, look, you read the headlines, and you see all the, the bleak news, and, and, and crime after crime is committed, and, and it just seems like tragedy after tragedy. And you say, what is the hope for our nation, and what is the hope for our churches? And uh, Brother Burks and I had the opportunity to travel for, uh, across this country and go to churches that are just struggling, that, are, that, are, that are, seem like they're dying on the vine. And you ask, what's the hope for a church that's dying and a, a church that's struggling? And, and I believe the hope is revival. I believe that God can, can send revival, and I believe God loves to send revival. And, and, uh, but, you know, I've been to church services before where God's done a great work in my life. And, man, he stirred me up, and, man, convicted me, and, and just, just brought me to tears, brought me to my knees, and, and just done a, a, just a life-changing work of revival in my life. Anyone ever had that happen to them before? And yet, yet many times I've left those services and I've walked out of those church buildings and just a matter of days or a matter of moments goes by and it seems like I forget about the revival that just happened in my life. And I forget about the, the change that took place in my life and, 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 and revival often wears off. Reminds me of the lady that asked Billy Sunday one time, she said, why do you still have revivals? She said, they don't last. To which he responded, well, why do you take baths? And... Uh, <laughs> You know, you, you, you can look at revival and say, you know, it's just, it's just a temporary thing and it's, it's really of no use and it's, there's really no point in talking about revival. But I believe tonight that we need frequent repeating revival in our lives and that, that there are times of refreshing that God delights to give when, when he visits us from heaven. And, and I pray that tonight as we look at Psalm chapter 85, which is really a revival passage, that, that God would teach us some truths and that God would give us some revival truth that can help us not just to have revival tonight, and that'd be great if the Lord did that, and that'd be great if God worked in our hearts and taught us some things, but, but a week beyond tonight, and a month beyond tonight, and a year beyond tonight, my prayer tonight is that we'll learn something that can help us to continually experience revival. And uh, I want to point out, just from Psalm chapter 85 tonight, three necessary elements for personal revival. Three necessary elements for personal revival. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for, for your word, and, and Lord, I just want to be a help tonight. I just want to be a blessing, and so, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to do that, and I pray that you'd uh, just help me to communicate these truths about revival, Lord. I pray that you'd give us a personal revival tonight, Lord. Lord, we're not asking for anything extravagant or anything that would glorify man, but, Lord, would you do something sweet in each and every one of our hearts tonight? Would you draw us to yourself, and would you turn our hearts to you? And would you have, have us leave here tonight, Lord, knowing that, that you did something special to, to give us a personal revival, Lord, that would last? And, Lord, we'll, we'll give you all the honor and praise for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I look at Psalm chapter 81, and I want to read the whole chapter if we can tonight. In, in, the, in the title of the chapter, it says, To the Chief Musician, and it says, A Psalm for the Sons of Korah. And verse number 1 says this, Thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation. And cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. 
Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. I notice, first of all, tonight, as we look at three necessary elements for personal revival, and, and I pray that our desire is that we would experience personal revival in our lives and that, that we would have something fresh and something new. And I see, first of all, in your notes, a past condition. A past condition. Here, uh, the, the psalm written for the sons of Korah, uh, the author here is writing, and he's reflecting back on a past condition and some things that God has done in the past. And boy, it's always appropriate to stop for just a moment and to think in our minds of the things that God has done in the past, the blessings that he's given to us, and the ways that God has maybe sent revival to our own personal lives, and, and to remember those things and to bring those things into remembrance. It's always appropriate to do that. But notice underneath that, they, they had enjoyed God's favor in the past. The psalmist made mention of the favor of God upon them. And uh, notice verse number one, it says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. You know, an earlier psalm written to the sons of Korah was, explains the reason why God did so many wonderful things for them in the past. And it says in Psalm 44, verse one, the psalmist writes, he says, We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days in the times of old, how thou didst drive out the heathen with thine hand and, and plantest them, and how thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. And notice what it says in verse number three, for they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arms save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. Tonight I want to say that God's favor is the, is the fountain of every blessing we receive in the Christian life. You ask somebody, why is it that God would have mercy upon us? And why is it that God would even look our direction? And why is it that God would lift somebody up out of the mire and set their feet upon a rock and put a new song in their mouth? Why would God even look our direction? It's because of God has, God has favor. And we recognize tonight that any success that we've had and any, any blessing that God's done, anything God has done maybe through us is all a result of, of, of not us, but God's favor upon our lives. I believe tonight we're in a church that knows what it's like to experience the favor of God, the smile of God from heaven upon this place. And uh, week after week, as our pastor stands up and preaches, and God smiles down upon this place through that man, I believe God's favor is on that place. And oh, how we need the favor of God upon our lives. Oh, how we need desperately the favor of God in everything that we do. And, and, and when, when, when divine favor is, is toward us in a situation, it's amazing how obstacles fall down and how barricades are just removed, and God paves the way for us. Oh, how we need the favor of God. Not only did they, they enjoy God's favor, but notice secondly underneath, they experienced God's freedom. Verse number 1b says this, Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. God had delivered them from captivity, and he had brought them, as you read the book of Nehemiah and, 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 and Ezra, and God had delivered them from a place of captivity. And I, and I want to say tonight that true spiritual freedom is an act of God. It's not a result of programs. It's not a result of, of our acts or our commitments or learning True spiritual freedom tonight is an act of God. It says in John chapter 8, verse 32, that you shall know the truth, and the truth, Jesus Christ, shall make you free. The Bible says in John 8, 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I love Galatians 5, 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All the spiritual freedom that we can experience in life is not a result of programs, but it's a result of God giving us that freedom. And can I say tonight for the men in the home that, that are going through this program, that if you're going to gain freedom over the addictions that, that bound you as you came here, and if, if you're really going to long-term have sobriety, and not just sobriety, but victory and, and freedom in Christ, that victory is going to come as a result of God granting you that freedom. It's possible to go through six months in the residential program at Rockford, Illinois, and still not have freedom. It's possible to finish the stronghold study course and never be granted spiritual freedom because freedom doesn't come from the men's home, from the, the women's home. True spiritual freedom comes from God. I read recently of a mailman who had worked for years and he was assigned to a new route and he was somewhat unfamiliar with this route that he was assigned. And so he was uh, going from porch to porch and house to house and trying to figure out the sidewalks and, and kind of the closest route between these two houses. And as he approached this particular house, he noticed that there was a, a mean-looking German shepherd right on the front porch of that house. And it didn't have a leash on or a collar, but that, that German shepherd was growling at him and staring at him and kind of mean-mugging him, you know. And, and uh, the mailman had to take the risk. He didn't want to go up to the house, but he realized that as part of his job, as part of his high-risk job, he had to go and, and, and approach that mailbox. And, and as he took a step closer to the yard, <coughs> the dog jumped up straight up in the air a couple of feet and landed in the same spot and kind of sat down and went like this and just sat there. Well, the man inside the house kind of heard some of the ruckus going on, and so he came out to see if everything was all right, and he said, uh, uh, he said to the man, he says, is everything okay out here? I heard some commotion going on. The mailman 
somewhat puzzled by the dog, said, well, well why did he do that? Well, why, did, why didn't he come after me? Why did he just jump and, and land and then sit there? The owner of the house said, well, oh, I remember now. He says, we took his chain off yesterday, and he just hasn't realized it yet. <laughs> you realize tonight that Jesus Christ removed the chains of sin the moment we got saved? Not only did he give us victory over the penalty of sin, thank the Lord one day we don't have to spend eternity in hell. Praise God for so great salvation as that. But you know what? That The day we got saved, you know what? Our chains were removed, and, and he, he breaks the power of canceled sin. I'm going to ask us tonight, do we realize that our chains have been broken? Or do we wear those chains not recognizing, not claiming the victory that God's given us over habits and over strongholds and over, over addictions in our lives? And, and we can experience freedom tonight. I just am so thankful tonight that, that nearly five years, just over five years ago, I showed up at the men's home on, on, on cocaine and on alcohol and, and on marijuana and so many other sins in my life. And, and I, I wore these heavy shackles of my addiction thinking that I had to wear these for the rest of my life, thinking that because I tried a secular program and it had failed, that I was bound to be a, and destined to be a drug addict for the rest of my life. Life. Paul, I'm thankful for the truth that Steve Currington brought out of John 8, 32, that you shall know the truth and that the truth shall make you free. And I realized just a few short months into that program that I didn't have to wear those chains for the rest of my life. And I didn't have to wear the shackles of my sin for the rest of my life. And I could be made free. And that I didn't have to live in, in, in bondage to those things that sin shall not have dominion over me. For I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. And grace is that which gives me the desire and the ability to do God's will for my life. And I'm rejoicing in the freedom that I've been given tonight. Not only did they experience God's freedom, they encountered God's forgiveness. Notice verse 2, the Bible says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. I'm not sure if that's how you say that. Selah, Selah. That means stop and think about it for just a moment. It means ponder that truth. Pastor Kingsbury taught us that recently. It means just to stop and, and, and think about that truth and, and grasp the weight of the words which we've just read and you know, when, when, when we cover our sin, it remains and we cannot prosper. But when God covers our sin, it's removed and we can be purified. In Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins and, and agree with God, that's what that word confess means, to agree with God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and wipe us clean from all unrighteousness. I read recently of an ancient tribal ceremony that was often observed in a particular tribe. And uh, the way the ceremony would go is if a son who had received an inheritance from his father was unwise in the stewardship of it. And if he had lost part of that inheritance with a, with a uh, uh, either by foolish business deal or by gambling part of it away or by spending it on foolish things like cattle or land, the whole village would respond with this ceremony. And here's how it worked. They would, every person in the village would gather a clay vase and they would fill that clay vase with stones and, and, and they would show up and march over to the house of this young man in this village and they would all line up at the front door of his house and they would bang on the door and wait for that man to come out in that front, the front house. And, and right as the man came out, they would all lift their clay pitchers above their heads and they would throw them on the ground all at the same time and shatter those clay pitchers on the ground in front of that house. Then all at once they would turn around and, and do a 180 and march the opposite direction. And that was their way of wiping their hands clean of that person and saying that we have nothing to do with you. We have no relationship with you any further. And they would wash their hands of that man. And, and the whole village would write him off and have nothing to do with him ever again. Aren't you thankful tonight that when we sin against God and when we, when we wrong our Father, when we do things that are against what He's commanded us to do in His Word, and when we mess up and we drop the ball and we do wrong, that God doesn't just write us off and smash a clay, pit, a clay pot right in front of our door, but that He's merciful to us and He's waiting for us to come back to Him. And like the father of the prodigal son waited for that man to take his journey down that long path, God waits for us to come and to fall down on our face and say, God, I have sinned. God, I messed up. God, I, I, I blew it again. And God's willing when we come to Him to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 4, 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sin is covered. In Psalm 103, 12, I love this. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. I remember the Rockford training days we had a few months ago when somebody put in 333 West State Street instead of 333 East State Street. And I got a phone call right about the time the sessions were starting, and they said, uh, Brother Ryan, I, I don't know, are you guys having the training at the, at the courthouse, or are you guys having it at the jail? And, uh, and I said, you know, no, tell me the address that you've got in there. And uh, he said, well, I got 333 West State Street. I said, well, let me, let me correct you. That's three. You're close. I said, it's 333 East State Street. 
And there's about a mile between East State Street, 333 East State Street, and 333 West State Street. There's a, there's a great distance between those two. But you know the distance that God put between him and my sin? And God, the, distance, the distance that God put between, between me and my sin, he's removed my transgressions far from me, not just from East State to West Street, but as far as the East is from the far of the West. So God says, God he's, has removed my transgressions from me. They encountered God's forgiveness, but notice fourthly underneath this, they escaped God's fierce anger. Verse 3 goes on to say, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. God had poured out his wrath upon the sons of Korah. And here was a group that was being written to that, uh, that had, had managed to escape God's fierce anger. And God had turned himself away from the fierceness of his wrath. Literally, that word fierceness means this. It means anger. It's, it's a heat or it's a burning. And God's anger is manifested towards sin. God's anger burns hot towards those who commit sin. We know that in the scriptures by Psalm 711. That God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. And God watches Fox News, I don't think you'd watch CNN, but when God watches Fox News, God's angry at those reports that happen on. God's angry when you and I fail him, and, and, but yet he wants us to come and confess, and, and uh, God's wrath burns hot towards sin. I'm told last year, last summer, there were five wildfires burning at the same time in Southern California. These fires destroyed countless homes and thousands of trees and several businesses and, and putting many lives in danger. And, you know, when a fire starts in a forest and that fire consumes everything in its path, houses and businesses and trees and, and puts lives in danger, I'm told that when you're trapped in a forest and that fire is burning through that forest, that, that the safest place to hide from the burning blaze is in a place that has already been burned up by the fire. But what most people do when they're trapped in the fire is they try to find the, the place where it's the driest and where it's the safest and where it's farthest away from the flames and they try to run away from the wrath and from the fire of that flame and you know, the fire of God's wrath burns towards sin. He hates sin so much that everyone who dies in their sin will spend an eternity in a place called hell that's burning with fire and flames. Who, there's gnashings of teeth. And Psalm 917 says this, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But Jesus Christ, God's perfect Son, stepped in our place, and when he went to the cross, he took upon him the fierceness of God's wrath towards sin. And God's wrath was unleashed on his only begotten son as he willingly went to the cross to face the wrath of God for our sins. And they publicly humiliated him on that cross after they had made fun of him. They called him disgraceful names. They punched him in the face. They, they yanked out his beard and they stripped his clothes off of his body. They set a nail on his wrist and pounded that nail into the wood. They grabbed his other hand and did the same thing. And they crossed his feet one on top of the other and nailed a hammer through both of his feet at the same time. And they propped him up on a cross and, and slammed that cross down into the ground. And you can hear him cry out as he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He prayed with compassion, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And from that fateful day 20 centuries ago until now, because the wrath of God was burned up on His only begotten Son, Jesus, there's a way for you and I to avoid the wrath of God towards sin. You and I can get in Christ. We can find safety in Christ. And His act of going to the cross that satisfied the wrath of God made room for everyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And one day when the fire of God's wrath blazes through those who have never trusted Christ, you and I can rest safe in the place that is in Christ because God's wrath has already burned up all the trees around His wrath when His wrath was unleashed upon His Son. In John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. Oh, that's why it's vital that you and I make sure that we've trusted Christ as our Savior. To make sure that we're not hiding among the trees and we're not trusting in any good merit of our own or any church membership or baptism or good works that we've done, but that we've trusted Christ and we're trusting and leaning solely upon Him for our salvation. These people in Psalm 85, at one point, they had enjoyed God's favor, but that favor was gone. They knew that what it was like to be granted freedom, but now they were in need of new mercies, as we'll see in just a moment. They had been forgiven, but they still needed revival. They had managed to avoid God's wrath that had wiped out many of the sons of Korah, but they still needed a fresh touch from heaven. And what I gather from all this tonight is this, as I look at this, that it's, can I say tonight that it's possible for you and I to have at one point had the favor of God upon us and to have witnessed miracle after miracle and blessing upon blessing and because of the favor of God upon this church and upon this ministry and upon our lives and still be in desperate need of personal revival. 
Can I say tonight that it's possible for you and I to be able to look back to the day when God gave us spiritual freedom and to be able to rejoice that God broke the power of canceled sin and and set the prisoner free and dropped the chains of our addiction and uh, and brought us out of a horrible pit and put our feet upon a rock and even put a new song in our mouth and and, and still have a great need for a Holy Ghost revival in our lives. Can I say tonight that it's possible to have had an encounter with the amazing forgiveness of God and, and to know the reality of the words that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound and to, to know the weight of my sin and to grasp the forgiveness that was given at the cross and to have at one point had the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse me from all sin and yet still have my deepest need be that I need a personal Holy Ghost revival in my life. Can I say tonight that it's possible to have escaped God's anger as they did and have to, to have gotten out of the chastening hand of God for a time and, and, and because of our position in Christ, be out of the, the, the line of God's wrath and still have our greatest need in our life be that we need personal revival. And so I see here not only did, was there a, 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 a past condition, but notice secondly tonight, there was a passionate cry. There was a passionate cry for revival that was mentioned here. For them, it was not enough for the psalmist to look back at blessings of the past. And I believe we ought to rejoice in what God's done. I believe we ought to take frequent looks back at all the blessings that God's given to us and all the victories that God's given to us and all the souls that God's allowed us to see saved and people that God's lives allowed, we've allowed to see changed and, and, and with gratitude look back and say, Lord, thank you. We, uh, we don't want to forget what you've done in this church and in our lives, but for the psalmist to look back at the blessings of the past was not enough for him. And he utters a passionate cry for revival in verse number six. He says this, Wilt not thou revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? J. Edwin Orr put it this way. He said, whenever God is ready to do something new with his people, he always sets them to praying. I ask a question. When was the last time we prayed for revival? And I'm preaching to myself tonight. When was the last time we prayed for revival? When was the last time we got alone with God and begged God for revival? Let me ask another question. How do we pray for revival? I, I mean, and, and, and God, 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 God hit me with this this last week as I studied this passage. When I get alone and pray for revival, and obviously we know we need revival. I need revival. Our church needs revival. We need revival in our lives. But do I just pray and say, God, give me revival, and that's it? What do I specifically pray when I'm asking God to give me revival? And for the psalmist, praying for revival meant praying for specific requests. And notice, first of all, a prayer for renewal. A prayer for renewal, letter A underneath number two. He asks God out of their need to revive, to restore, uh, to, to renew. He says in verse number six, Wilt not thou revive us again? And so many times in my life I recognize areas of my life that need revival, and maybe we even pray for revival in our lives. But I'm thankful tonight that we can ask God to do some specific things in our lives and to revive specific areas of our lives. I looked up that word revive here in verse number six, and the word revive here is the Hebrew word chaya. Sounds like a karate word like a kid would do. Chaya. That's not what it means. It's not a karate kick or anything like that, but it sounds that way. But it's chaya. It's C-H-A-Y-A-H is the, is, is the English spelling of the word. And, and uh, this word is translated in many other passages in the Psalms as the word quicken. And so when we pray for revival, we can learn a lot about how to pray for revival by looking at the, the, the mentions of this name chaya or chaya or quicken. And so this word is used, number one, in relation to our prayer life. The Psalm 80, verse 18 says this, Quicken us, the psalmist prayed, and we will call upon thy name. You know, tonight we can ask God to revive our prayer life when it's lacking. This word is used in a second occasion in Psalm 119, 25. It's used in connection to God's word. Psalm 119, 25 says this, Quicken me according to thy word. You know, we can pray. We can ask God to renew our desire for his word when we are complacent. You say, how do I pray for revival? We pray that God would give us that passion and that desire for his word and that longing and that thirsting and that hungering for the manna from heaven. We can pray for God to give us revival regarding his word. Psalm 119, 37, the verse is used again. It says, turning away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. This word is used in reference to following God's path. You know what, tonight we can pray for God to restore our desire to do his will when we don't feel like it. You ever wake up in the morning and don't feel like serving God? I'm going to take a day off today, you know, I don't feel like uh, going out and doing the right thing and don't feel like doing the devotions, I'd rather hit the snooze button. And, you know, when when we need revival, we can say, God, I don't feel like it. And God, I need you to to, to quicken me. God, give me life. And it says in Romans chapter 8, but it's the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Watch this now. He that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So when I need to pray, God, quicken me. God, give me revival in my prayer life. God, God, quicken me. Give me revival in my study of your word and in my following your path. But it's used again in Psalm 119, 40, which says this, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. 
this word is used in connection with a holy life. And we can say, God, revive my hunger for your righteousness. And you know what? He will. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So we can pray a prayer for renewal, but notice, secondly, a prayer for redirection. Verse number four, if you back up a couple verses from verse number six. <clears throat> verse number four says, Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. One of the best prayers you and I can pray as it relates to revival is this. God, turn me in the right direction. God, turn me away from my sin and turn me towards you and turn me away from bad habits and turn me towards the right habits and turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thine anger toward us to sin. Rather than praying, God, don't be angry with us. Don't be upset with us. God, have mercy on us. They said, no, Lord, change us and make us not do things that make you angry. In essence, they're praying, God, turn us from sin and turn us toward you. Turn us from the things that brought us into captivity in the first place and turn us to you who have the power to give us freedom. You know, it's one thing to pray, God, remove the consequences of my sin. It's quite another to pray, God, turn me away from the things that caused me to sin against you. I believe there's times in our lives we ought to ask the Lord to remove our hearts away from the small g gods that can enter in so easily and to redirect or to turn our hearts and to turn our focus in our direction towards the, the one living and true God. Paul, Paul approached the church at Thessalonica and they were a church that was, that was worshiping idols and they had many, many idols set up and horrible sins going on. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, he said this, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And watch this now, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what the prayer for revival is, is a prayer for redirection that says, God, I may be headed down the, right, the wrong path, and God, maybe it's not completely a 180, the wrong direction, but God, if I'm not going directly towards you and in your path and following what your will for my life is, then God, you've got to redirect me and line up my will with your will and my plans with your plans and my desires with your desires, and we can pray a prayer for revival that says, Lord, redirect us in your direction. I read a quote by G. Campbell Morgan that says this, Revival cannot be organized but we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. This past weekend, we traveled to Napa, California, and I went with Brother Burks and, uh, and Mrs. Burks and Pastor and Pastor Lane from, from Florida. and Had a great time. Went to Brother, uh, Pastor Mike Ray's church, Hopewell Baptist Church there in Napa. And I think it's the wine capital of the world because the hotel we stayed at was the Napa Winery Inn. And, there's vineyards all over the mountains and just a, just, a, just a huge need for addictions and people struggling in that place. And, and man, God met with us in a powerful way at that conference and had great services. And, and we went from uh, Wednesday night through, thir- through Friday night. And from uh, <clears throat> Friday night or from Saturday and Sunday, we went down to Sacramento to uh, Faith Baptist Tabernacle. Pastor Mike Rogers and, and uh, Brother Burks did a training weekend there and he preached on Sunday. And so I was kind of the tag along. I didn't have anywhere to go, so I didn't have anywhere to preach that weekend. So I kind of went along for the ride. And so I thought, you know, I'll kind of navigate as we're going on this trip, and I'll get us to the, to the La Quinta, or the, if you're from the, the La Quinta Inn, which is it, La Quinta or La Quinta Inn, and so we're headed to the La Quinta Inn in Sacramento, and I didn't realize it, but there's two La Quinta Inns in Sacramento, and so I, I put the GPS in, and I said, I said, you know, we're going to La Quinta Inn, and, and uh, we're headed down that way, and, and uh, before I know it, we're headed downtown Sacramento, and uh, the, the, the director at the church had told us clearly that the hotel is in North Highlands. It's not close to Sacramento at all. And so I was navigating, and here we are. We're seeing the, you know, the, the Sacramento buildings of downtown, and we're driving downtown towards Sacramento. And, and Brother Burks goes, are you sure we're heading the right direction? So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're sure. We're sure about that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yep, see, I got it plugged in here, La Quinta in Sacramento, and he was right, and it was true. And, you know, it, it was a moment of I had to humble myself as we got closer and as we realized the longer I wait before telling him that we're going the wrong way, the, the, the more stupid I'm going to look, and I already look kind of stupid. <clears throat> so finally, I said, hey, hey, Brother Brooks, I blew it. I said, I got the wrong address in the GPS. And so, you know, what we had to do, we had to do a U-turn and redirect our path and head down towards the right La Quinta Inn. And, and before we headed to the hotel, uh, he said, you know, I'm looking forward to getting about 12 hours of, of, of break between services. And so after we made our U-turn, I said, well, at least we got 11 and a half hours now of uh, break between the services. And, and uh, you, know, we, we, we had, you know what we did? We had to redirect ourselves. We were headed towards downtown, and we realized we were going the wrong direction. We had to stop and make a 180 and, and head back the right direction. You know, it turned out pretty well. I think because of that, I was officially uh, relieved of my navigation duties. Um, <laughs> they didn't ask me to, to, to guide them anywhere, to restaurants, to hotels, to churches, nowhere. I just sat in the back, and it was pretty nice, actually. So uh, I wish I'd have known that 
two days before, but that's okay. But you know, that GPS is a lot like our heart. Wherever it is aimed, our, see, our feet soon follow, and our affections follow, and our actions follow. And eventually, our path follows the direction of our heart. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, to keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And that heart focus is like the compass, like that navigation, like that GPS, which guides us in that direction. And sometimes when our feet are going the wrong direction, we don't know why. And well, God, why am I falling in this area again? And God, why am I not experiencing victory the way that you said I would? And the freedom that you promised to me in your word. God, why don't I have it? A lot of times I need to say, God, realign my heart with you. God, redirect my heart to focus on you so that my affections will line up with my heart, so that my feet will line up with my affections, so that my habits will line up with my feet, so that my path will line up with my habits. That's how I change the path for my life. I pray a prayer for, for redirection. And that's one reason why we ought to frequently pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. One of the most powerful parts about self-examination is the willingness to say, God, if I'm wrong and if I've sinned against you, if there's something inside of me that's not right, God, I'm willing to be redirected. Lead me in the way everlasting. But not only a prayer for redirection, notice thirdly, a prayer for revelation. He prayed that God would cause them to look intently on one specific attribute of God's, and that was his mercy. Notice verse number seven. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. That word show doesn't mean to, uh, in this passage, or doesn't mean to, to, to display mercy, or that, that it wasn't as if they were in need of fresh mercies necessarily based on this verse. What the ver- word here means, it means to cause to see, to cause to gaze at, to, to look intently upon. In other words, they had already received mercy. God had already been good to them. God had already spared them from the the judgment that came on the sons of Korah. And he's not necessarily praying for more mercy as much as he's praying that God would allow him to fully grasp the enormity of the mercy that they had already received. One of the greatest prayers for revival that you and I can pray is a prayer of revelation that says, God, open mine eyes so that I can fathom the weight of what you've already done for me. God, open my eyes and let me see how much forgiveness I've already experienced in my life. God, open up my eyes and let me see where I would end up were it not for you in my life. A few nights ago, I got pulled over in Love's Park, and I know what you're thinking, and the answer is no, I was not. Okay, I was not speeding. But uh, I got pulled over in Love's Love's Park, and I was heading down 2nd Street and got pulled over by a police officer in an SUV, and and apparently had a headlight out, didn't realize it. And uh, the officer walked up to the vehicle and said, uh, let me see your license and registration, he said. And I, re- I realized at that moment, I, usually I carry it with me, but I didn't have it with me at the time. And, uh, and so I reached in my pocket and I said, oh, officer, I am so sorry. So I don't have my ID with me. I said, well, you got to forgive me. He said, well, hey, that's okay, but why don't you just come out of the car and come with me and, and just sit in the car with me while we figure out who you are. <laughs> and, uh, and now there was a day when I would have ran, but, but uh, <clears throat> I said, you know what? Didn't have, didn't have anything on me, figured it'd be okay, and uh, so I got out and went and walked. Apparently, there's a policy in the state of Illinois that if you don't have an ID or a lot of states, especially in a, in a high crime area like this, that they want to make sure that you're, that you're uh, not going anywhere. So I jumped in the back of the SUV, and those seats were padded. I'm telling you, the most comfortable seats I've ever sat in before. <laughs> and, I, and I almost said out to the officer, I almost said, you know, these are a lot more comfortable than the ones in Oregon State, but... Uh, <laughs> I thought, no, that's probably not a good idea to say that. You know, we probably, probably don't want him, to, uh, want him to, to, uh, to think that I have experience with this kind of thing. And he ran my name, and he says, yep, that's you. He said, yep, Ryan Giles. He said, uh, uh, J20772482 was the license number that I told him to plug in there. And he said, uh, wow, he said, you don't have any speeding tickets, nothing on your record. And I paused for a moment and said, yes, sir. And I thought, I'm thankful that I'm not in Oregon. But praise the Lord. In the state of Illinois, there's, there's nothing on the record. And, and uh, yes, sir, it's all clean. And uh, I said, you know, uh, insurance is, is, is valid. License is valid. And, uh, you know, I, I started to have a pretty good time. I'll be honest with you, I was hanging out with the police officer. And it was a little bit warmer in his car than it was in my car. And I thought, you know, let's just have a conversation. So I started talking about some statistics I read about crime for, for, the, state of, uh, uh, for the city of Rockford, Illinois. And I told him, you know, uh, out, of, out of cities that are 200,000 people or less, I said, did you know that Rockford is number two for worst crime for cities that size? He says, yeah, I've heard about that. Man, we started getting a friendship going, and, uh, and I thought everything was great. In the back of my mind, I'm calling him sir, and I'm thinking, if I just be nice, he's not going to write me a fix-it ticket, and he's not going to give me a fine for carrying my license. And uh, pretty soon he, he, he says, you know, I, I got a piece of paper here. I got a pad here. He said, uh, how would you feel if I just wrote you a warning today? Would that be all right with you? I said, yes, sir, that would make my day. 
And he says, you know, and, and, and right at that moment, I didn't really think much of it. I thought, you know, I, a warning, great. But he says, you know, I could if I wanted to, he said. I could give you a $125 ticket for the, uh, not having your license on you. And he said, I could give you a fix-it ticket. He said, but I'm not going to do that. He says, you're not up to any trouble. And as far as I can tell, you're not causing any trouble. He says, here's a fix-it ticket. He said, you got two days to fix the headlight. And he said, have a great day. Praise the Lord, you know. And right at that moment after he told me the, the potential consequences of that, all of a sudden I realized that he was very merciful. He was very kind. And he was very gracious and very compassionate. And, uh, you know, I, I, why does God want me to focus on his mercy and to intentionally uh, realize how much mercy he has shown me in my life? I believe Luke chapter 7, verse 47 has the answer that says this, To whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same love, the same love with little. Listen, my view of salvation is, well, you know, God saved me, but I'm not as sinful as one of those guys in the men's home or one of those ladies in the ladies' home. And, and you know, God saved me, but, he, you know, he didn't require as much blood to save me as he did someone over here. Then how much love is, am I going to be expressing towards the Lord for my salvation? But if, on the other hand, I recognize that had God not intervened in my life, that I was a wicked wretch headed towards a destructive hell that had no right for God to even look my way, and that it's his mercy, his great mercy that I'm saved, that he even pays attention and looks my way, you know what, my heart's going to be flooded with a love and with a, with, a, with a desire to serve him and to show him how much I appreciate him. And all I'm saying tonight is it's, it's always appropriate for us to take a look back and to focus on the mercy of God where we were when Jesus found us and that horrible pit that he brought us up out of and to say, thank you, Lord, for showing the mercy upon my life that you showed. And when we do that, God seems to ignite a love and a passion in our heart when we recognize that I love him because he first loved me. Jude 122, I think Jude had it down when he said this. He said, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I think Jude recognized the, the, the importance of us being kept in God's love and of focusing, gazing, looking intently upon the mercy of God until, unto eternal life or until the day that Jesus comes. But notice not only a prayer for revelation, but they prayed a prayer for rescue. Notice the end of verse number 8. He prayed that God would grant them his salvation. Verse number 8 says this, grant us thy salvation. Now, they had already called him the God of our salvation in verse number four. Notice verse number four. Turn us, O God of our salvation. But now they're asking God to grant them his salvation, his deliverance. And obviously for you and I under the new covenant, we don't have to keep asking God for salvation over and over and over again. Praise God, once saved is always saved. And, and just like a baby's born and it doesn't have to be keep being born and born again, uh, praise the Lord, when we get born again, we don't have to get born again and 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 again, again, again. One time saved, always saved, sealed by the Holy Spirit on the day of redemption and uh, re receive the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Praise God for that truth. Once saved, always saved. And, and, uh, but our asking God for salvation and for deliverance the moment we got saved it ought not to be the last time we ask God for deliverance. We ought to be in the habit as we pray for revival in our lives of asking God to deliver us. And it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Can I ask a question tonight? That area that you need deliverance in, have you struggled to get out of it? Have you tried everything you can? Have you, have you uh, studied scriptures and tried to do everything you know how to do to escape it and to... To, to get deliverance from it? Can I ask a further question? Have you asked God just to take it away? Have you asked God to turn your heart in his direction and to take away the desire to even participate in that thing and to even want that thing and to even desire that thing? Have you asked God to remove and to purify their, your heart from that thing and to say, God, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And, and when we pray for rescue, you know what? He comes to our rescue. But not only did they have a passionate cry in a past condition of revival of blessings that they look back upon. But notice thirdly tonight, a personal commitment. When we beg God for revival in specific areas of our lives and God answers our prayers for, for renewal and for redirection and for revelation of his mercy and for rescue from, uh, from danger and, and to, to, to bring us salvation, there's, some, there's a commitment that we can make that goes beyond that moment of revival in our lives. And I want to give you a couple things tonight, some actions we can take that will be our personal commitment to revival. Because I know I've sat underneath preaching and I've seen God move and God speak in my heart and God do amazing things in my life and, and God's put his finger on areas and said, Ryan, you need to repent of that and Ryan, you need to pick up that habit and Ryan, you need to pray and Ryan, you need to get rid of that thing and, 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 and week has gone by and I've, I've fallen back into those same things all over again. And so what's the personal commitment of revival? Notice first of all, to rejoice in his character. 
to rejoice in his character. Notice Psalm chapter 85 and verse number 6. The psalmist prayed, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? One of the commitments of revival is this, that I'm going to find my, my greatest joy and my greatest satisfaction and my greatest fulfillment, not in a hobby, not in a possession, not in a relationship, but in my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to rejoice in thee. And there's something that can continue revival when I'm determined in my heart that no matter what happens and no matter what trials come my way, that my rejoicing is going to be in the Lord uh, constantly. And, you know, it's amazing that, that joy is not always a natural response in my life. I'll be honest with you. I don't always wake up and go, oh, it's 5 in the morning, good morning, and wake up with a smile. And how many of you know someone like that? They wake up and they're singing and you just want to kind of punch them and, and they got a smile on their face. Th- that's not me. But here's what I've learned about joy. And I've got a lot to learn about. Here's what I've learned about joy. That God has commanded commanded me to rejoice in all things. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And, uh, and as I obey the command to rejoice, you know what happens? God gives me joy. Genuine joy. And I face a trial and I face a circumstance that I don't feel like rejoicing. I don't feel like thanking God for it. It's a difficult situation. You know what I say? Lord, thank you for this thing. And Lord, I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to glory in my infirmities, as Paul said. And I take one step of obedience. You know what I realize? Is that my smile is genuine. Because I followed the command to rejoice. And like Jesus said in John 13, 17, if you know these things, happy are ye if you what? If you do them. I love what Habakkuk said as he had a discouraging day. He said this. He said, although the fig tree shall not blossom, he said, and neither shall fruit be in the vines, and the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. He said, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. He said this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet and cause me to walk upon mine own places. Habakkuk said, I have a commitment to revival that says, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. He prayed in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. He said, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. He said, in the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. He said, Habakkuk knew what it was to fall on his face and pray for revival. But his commitment to revival was this. No matter what happens, I'm going to rejoice in him and his character and his attributes. More than any circumstance, more than any blessing, more than any other relationship, I'm rejoicing in him. Rejoice in his character And letter B, respond to his voice. Verse 8 goes on and says this, a commitment of revival. says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. The commitment of revival tonight is a willingness to hear and respond to God's voice when he speaks. You know, it's intriguing to me that the word hear and the word hearken in the Old Testament is the same Hebrew word. And, and, I, and I wonder if people that were uh, in the Old Testament, if, if in their minds there was no difference between hearing and obeying. Boy, it's a lot different, isn't it now? We hear and we, I know many times I'll hear a sermon and I'll hear the things that I want to do or the things that maybe seem easier to do than the hard things that challenge me. And I'll say, you know, I'll, 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 I'll take this kind of like a meal. You know, I'll eat the, I'll eat the steak and I'll eat the, eat the potatoes, but I'm not eating the asparagus, you know. And I'll, I'll pick and choose what I want to have. And, and, and one of the commitments of revival says this, I will hear what God's word will speak. Whatever he speaks to my heart and to my soul, I'm going to hear it and I'm going to obey it. James Stewart said this about revival. He said this, revival is the people of God living in the power of an ungrieved, unquenched spirit of God. I read of a Sunday school teacher that asked her class if leopards can change their spots. And all the kids in the classroom uh, shook their heads no, but there was one little girl that nodded her head yes. Yes. The teacher asked, she said, I don't, I don't think you heard the question. The question is this, can the leopard change his spots? And again, all the, all the girls in the class went like this, and one little girl went. The teacher asked the little girl, what do you mean by that? And the little girl said, well, I don't, know why, uh, I don't know why a leopard who doesn't like his spot can't go to another. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> So simple, yet so profound. Because the, the rest of the verse says this, Can the leopard change his spots or the Ethiopian his, his, his skin? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. And many times we look at a habit or we look at a, a, a trench or a path that we've walked and maybe some discouraging habits that we can't seem to break and some chains that we can't seem to set down and we say, maybe I'm just made this way. Maybe this is just the way that I was born and maybe I'm just bound to be an addict because my, my family was an addict and my father was an addict my grandfather was an addict. And God says, no, anyone can change his spot. Anyone can change his position. If we hear the voice of God and respond to God's voice, God can grant us repentance. 
2 Timothy 2.25, and, and God shall give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. When we respond to the voice of God, God can give us repentance and we can change our lives as a result, not just our, our, our condition. Uh, number three, retain his peace. Verse number eight, the last part of the verse says this, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. So he's committed to hear the voice of God, but the verse goes on to say, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints but let them not turn unto folly again. Here it says that God will speak peace unto his people. And can I say tonight that the greatest message that we have is the truth about how the world can have peace with God. We live in a world that's at enmity with God. They're, they're the enemies of God. And, and it says in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse number 20 that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. It says, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And yet you and I have a truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ who went to a cross nearly uh, 2,000 years ago and died on that cross, not just so that we could have eternal life, but so that a lost world who is at enmity with God tonight could be reconciled to him and have peace with God. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But the peace of God, the, the peace with God is just the beginning for those of us who are saved. You see, all believers have peace with God relationally, positionally, because of our forgiveness that took place at the cross. But not every Christian has the peace of God evident in their lives. The peace of God replaces anxiety when we, uh, in everything by prayer and supplication, make it a habit to make our prayer requests known unto God. And when we do that, verse 7 of Philippians chapter 4 says this, The peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I read a quote recently that said this, You cannot know the peace of God until you intimately get to know the God of peace. We've all experienced moments when the Peace of God has flooded our soul and there's tranquility and there's, uh, there's calmness and there's serenity and we know that everything is, is going to work out and that God's in control of those situations, but why is it so easy to lose the peace of God? And just like that, it's gone. We make one wrong move outside of God's leading and the Spirit's leading or we maybe commit a sin and, and uh, it says in Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are called in one body and be ye thankful. That word rule literally means this, to play the referee and to blow the whistle when there's something wrong. I wasn't going to bring this up, but uh, the Jets played the Packers back in 2014, September 2014, and, and uh, with about five minutes left in the fourth quarter, the Jets completed a touchdown pass on the fourth uh, down to tie the game, but the touchdown didn't count. See, right before the ball was snapped, the offensive coordinator for the Packers, Marty uh, Morhenweg, however you say that, he called a timeout, and the ref blew the whistle right before the snap. The Jets' touchdown didn't count because timeout had been called. The Packers won the game 31-24. When the Holy Spirit calls timeout because of a sin and he removes his piece, he's playing the referee, it's at that moment we decide one of two things. Either I will let the peace of God rule in my life and I'll stop to confess before I can move on with my Christian life or I'll decide to continue on and to ignore that still small voice of conviction in my life. And verse number eight says, I'll turn again to folly. And so when we let the peace of God rule, we are letting him play the referee in our life. Notice number four, we're done tonight. Reverence his person. Reverence his person. God's deliverance was close to them as they had a reverence for him. Notice verse number 9. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. You know, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I read recently of a study that was done of the, of the, of the awe subject, the subject of awe. I'm looking across the audience, some of you are in awe right now. Maybe you're sleeping. Maybe you're, you're like, it's 8.10, we need to be done. I'm just about through, I promise. But, but they did a study about awe and the feeling of awe. And when you, when you, when you see the Grand Canyon and that feeling of just breathtaking awe that, go, that comes over you, or, or maybe it's the, uh, uh, it's the Eiffel Tower from the very top, you look down and there's just this feeling of awe that comes over you that they just can't explain. Well, scientists did a, 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 a study on this. Psychologist uh, Melanie Rudd and Jennifer Aker of Stanford University Graduate School Business uh, they, uh, they, they devised a way to study this feeling of awe in their laboratory. And they did three different experiments about awe. And here's what they found. That jaw-dropping moments uh, made people that had them, that were in awe, they made them do four things. Number one, they feel like they had more time available. Number two, they found that they made them more patient. Number three, they were less materialistic. 
And number four, they were more willing to volunteer to help, uh, time to help other people. And I just believe tonight, some of us maybe perhaps need to just get our awe of God back again. And that respect and that reverence and that fear of God that the psalmist says, my heart standeth in awe of thee, he said. Like David said in Psalm chapter 8, he said, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, which has set thy glory above the heavens. He said, when I consider thy heavens, the, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that thou visitest him. For thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Thou hast put all things under his feet. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And the commitment to revival is the commitment to fear God and to, to continually reverence his person, recognizing that he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our respect. I pray tonight that we be committed to revival. I pray that we wouldn't be just content with conditions of the past blessing that God's done. And God's been good to us as a church. And God's been good to us as, as individuals. And God's done some amazing things in our lives. But may we passionately cry for revival and say, God, you've got to revive me. God, you've got to redirect my heart. God, you've got to reveal your mercy. And God, you've got to rescue me when temptation comes. And then commitment to revival that says, God, I'm going to hear what you speak. God, I'm going I'm to reverence your person and I'm going to rejoice in you alone. And I believe we can walk out of here with some tools that can help us to have revival, not just tonight. Not just next week, not just next month. But I believe there's some truths here that can help us to have revival all the way through 2015.